At that time, Jesus said, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can, at the same time, speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands go into Gehenna into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From the second reading. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away, your clothes have become moth-eaten, your gold and silver corroded. The corrosion will be a testimony against you. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. We're not going to talk about that, because that's like, like really dramatic and all that. So, um, but if any of that you think it applies to you, pay attention to that. Seriously. If you think anything there, like, like, oh my gosh, maybe I need to think about X, Y, or Z. Well, think about X, Y, or Z. Okay, I, I didn't want to go into that, that whole thing. I just thought it'd be nice and dramatic, wake everybody up on the sleepy Sunday morning with a little fire and brimstone. But what I wanted to, to, to go into here was from in the gospel, like, like last week, you'll remember we saw the, the, the apostles, they were... They're fighting with each, other, with each other about who's the greatest, who did the most, and, and all that. Well, they're at it again. And it, when I want to, even though, like, I know I do this and a lot of other uh, preachers do this as well, they'll, they, use, they hold up the, the apostles as these examples of what not to be. Don't think that the apostles were spiritual or moral dunces. They weren't. They're stand-ins for all of us. And so they, and don't think that if we were in the same place, oh, I wouldn't have done that. I would have gotten that question right. No, no, no. We, they're, it's like, no, this is every one of us. That's who they're standing in for. That's who they represent. It's representing every aspect of the human heart. And it's particularly tough for them. It's not entirely fair to them because they're standing next to Jesus Christ, the Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the only perfect man in all of humanity, in all of history, and that's who they're standing in contrast with. So it's not going to look great. It'd be like if I were to try to play the organ after Jared plays it. It's just not going to come out well. It's just not a good look. It's not a good take. But, but that's what, where the apostles are all the time, constantly doing things, and, and our Lord's using it as a teaching moment. So what we see here, okay, that said, I'm still going to kind of beat him up here a little bit. That said, what we see here is John coming to our Lord, disconcerted, kind of bent out of shape, that, Lord, we, we saw someone and they were casting out demons, but they're not part of our group here, and they're doing it in your name, so, so we stopped him. We told him not to, because he's not one of us. And you imagine there's probably, a, this is like one of those facepalm moments for, for our Lord. Here is somebody somewhere doing good things, casting out demons, probably also carrying things like that, in the name of Jesus, and they're telling him, stop. How many times would the Pharisees pick on Jesus, saying, no, you shouldn't, it's the Sabbath, you shouldn't be curing, you shouldn't be healing. 
don't do those things, you're not doing it right, we know it's right. And here are the apostles, John in particular, doing that very thing. Stop doing that good thing that you're doing. It just really looks bad. But, but I think we, again, it's not that these were spiritual dunces. But what's happening is what's coming out of John's heart in this instance, and probably the, uh, the rest of them, is something that would be coming out of our heart too if we were in the same situation. So what is that? What's going on? Remember a couple chapters back, Jesus sent out all the disciples, all the the 12 apostles, two by two. And he gave them power to cast out demons, power to heal. They're preaching, they're preparing the way. And they went out and they did all that and they came back really excited. And this was amazing. We did these things. And in your name, we cast out demons. In your name, we had the power to do this, that, and the other thing. And it must have started to settle in a little bit, like, wow, this is really cool. We get to show up someplace, and all of a sudden, we're the best thing in town. Because Jesus hasn't come through yet. We're just preparing the way. But we're casting out demons, and, and, and these people are just so grateful to us, and so amazed at this, this new teaching. And it begins to grow. And now they start to walk with a little more confidence in their step. That, yeah, the demon, I can, I can cast him out. I mean, it's Jesus. Jesus is doing it. So it, it wouldn't have been just bald pride or vainglory because they've been with our Lord. They've, they've been humbled many times. Yet somehow, I think, and this, this is, I was reading, a, this is a, a commentary by Scott Hahn that I was reading earlier this week that he was pointing this out. What was really going on is that they were trying to protect their special status as the ones that had the real superpowers from Jesus and others, well, they're not with our group, so they shouldn't be doing that. Do, they have, do you have permission to do that? And so they want to stop them. Yeah, they're, they're, it start, it's going to start watering down the special status that they have, the special gifts that they have. Maybe some people will start to follow that other guy and not us when we walk into town. That is absolutely 100% common to human nature throughout the entire history of mankind. Just as much back then as it was after the fall, as it what is today and will be for the next however long humanity lasts. We all do that. They happen to do it right to Jesus with him standing there in a real cru- crucial, very public moment so that now 2,000 years later, we're like, oh my gosh, look what they did. But we do it too. We try to protect our special status. This, this little bit of one-upmanship about no, I've got, I've got this, and this is how I'm important, and this is how I'm special. Pride. It's, as by many spiritual ex- experts has been, saints that is, has been pointed out to be the hardest vice to spot in yourself and the easiest vice to spot in somebody else. As soon as I say this, like pride, someone's full of themselves. Oh yeah, I know all kinds of, yeah, I see that person, that person, that that person. Anyone who's on any kind of a public platform, any public stage, like yeah, 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 there, 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 all all around, you see, it's it's all there. Yeah, you ask them themselves, no, 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 I'm I'm, I'm pride, I mean, maybe a little bit, but it's the hardest to see in ourselves. But it's also, really, really hard work to keep it up. Because what are we doing when, we're, when we allow our pride to kind of take seat and grow and, and start to, start to uh, manifest itself in our lives? Well, we're allowing an exaggeration or some form of a lie to take root in our lives, some exaggerated opinion about ourselves. And just like a lie, it's like, well, Okay, if that's the exaggerated opinion, well, or a lie almost about ourselves, I, I need two more to, to back that up. So like if you tell a lie, you need like two more to defend that one. And in order to defend those two, you need like four more. And then there's this exponential growth. And that's, that's a lot of work. 
And we're constantly doing that. We all do that. We all carry that weight around of trying to defend our pride. No, I was right in that situation. I was justified in this situation because, no, I mean, this is, anyone would have been justified. And someone else is standing over who watched the whole thing play it was like, mm, nah, no, that was, that was pretty bad. <laughs> that was just you just being full of yourself. So pride is really tough work. What is the opposite of that? And that's what we want to focus on. Sure, we can try to scrub it out as much as we can. Pride. And we should look for it, spot it. As we spot it in others, watch for it in yourself. Be attentive. It's not going to be easy to spot. Gluttony is easy to spot in yourself. Just standing on the scale. And it's like, there. There it is. Uh, but, but pride is, is a lot more difficult because it's so, so subtle. Now, if, if pride is so hard... Humility, the opposite virtue, which is a strength. Virtue comes from Latin virtus, which means strength, is easy. It's not complicated. It's not a burden to carry around. Because we've got nothing to defend. No lie or exaggeration about ourselves, even deeply subconsciously, to try to defend. So what, what is, what is a, we want to take a little bit more of a look at this. Someone who is humble, they rejoice in goodness no matter where they find it. They rejoice, and they're glad for it. it. It doesn't trigger envy or jealousies of any kind. It, they rejoice if, it in, they see, in a, if they see goodness in someone else. If they see goodness in themselves, they rejoice in that too. And that's totally fine. That's rejoicing in the truth. It's not a lie. It's not an exaggeration. It's, it's a gift that God has given them. But they know where the gift came from. The, the catechism, uh, when in, in explaining humility, it says, Humility, it's the virtue by which Christians acknowledge God as the author of all good. It's a virtue by which we avoid inordinate ambition or pride. Inordinate, that's a key word there. Because sometimes we should be striving for things. And there's such a thing as a healthy pride. Where it's not, it's not a vice, it's like just I'm proud, of, uh, I'm proud to be Catholic or, or I'm proud to be Christian. It's something like that. That's, that's a healthy pride. It provides a foundation for turning to God in prayer. Have you noticed, like, when, when you're really trying to grab onto something, defend it, like something, you know how hard it is to pray then? Like, I'm trying to defend this one thing. Well, I did this, and this probably wasn't the best, but I was justified. Yeah, it's, all of a sudden, it's like it come, becomes a lot harder <laughs> to get on your knees and pray because you've still got this, your heart, you just built this wall around it, this defense, you, this, this brick wall around it to protect it. St. Thomas Aquinas, when he, said, when he uh, spoke about humility, he said it was seeing ourselves as God sees us. And there's something really freeing about that. Because when God looks at us, He doesn't look at us with these judgmental eyes. He looks at us with love. And even with that love, He sees us just as we are with all that is good, and all that is not, and he still loves us. And he wants the, the bad things to change, and he's encouraging us, he's blessing us, and he's helping us, supporting us. He wants to heal those things, but he recognizes them for exactly what they are. But the love doesn't change. And he's always hoping for better and encouraging and lifting us up. And so the, the humble person does that, and they say, Well, Lord, how do you see my neighbor? How do you see this individual? He looks at them as a son or daughter of God and has great desires and hopes for them. I have a, 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 a when I was in, in high school, I was in Boy Scouts for a while, and, and our troop master, Mr. Henry, is a man that was very humble in this kind of free kind of sense. Not, there's, there's a false humility where we just beat ourselves, oh, I'm no good at anything, and I'm really bad, and I always met, and we're just kind of putting ourselves down because actually there's a, there's a deep pride hidden there because we're trying to 
anyway, so I'll, that's another, another time. But, but he wasn't like that. He was just the most free, outgoing, generous individual. And when we go on a camp out, he, he and some of the other leaders, they bring on their instruments, uh, guitars, banjo, and, and this, is back in, this is back in the 80s. And there, there had been a song that came out in 1980, and he would sing the first line of it and wouldn't be able to sing anymore. And it'd start out like this, and there's, some of you might know the, know the song. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. He would stop and burst out laughing just because he just found that so hilarious. I think I've probably told that, that, that story before. And he just couldn't continue it because he just thought it was so hilarious that anyone could be so fun. I mean, it's a spoof song. It's supposed to be. But like for him, there's this, like this freedom of being able to laugh at all this puffed up pride, all this vanity. And he was really awfully, the more I think about him and the other's examples, I say, wow, he just, he's just really just gifted in this, in this virtue, this grace to be, to be humble and just, just wasn't concerned about himself. He did wonderful, marvelous things for us. And, exercise, and showed a lot of leadership there. Oh, one more story that, um, that somebody else shared. I think it might be a year or two ago I might have shared this story. Uh, pope Benedict, uh, maybe about two or three years before he was pope, he was Cardinal Ratzinger at the time in Rome. And one of my brother um, seminarians at the time was there in, in Rome with his, uh, with his family. And they were going across St. Peter's Square. And all of a sudden they, they see Cardinal Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict, walking across, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's Pope Ben, it's, it's, it's Cardinal Ratzinger, one. Let's, let's get a picture with him. Because he was walking by himself, he was going to work. <laughs> he was commuting across St. Peter's Square, what a, what a heck of a commute. And they went up to him and, and greeted him and said hello and said, uh, uh, excuse me, your eminence, uh, we, we'd like a picture. And just without missing a beat, without any sense of errors or anything, oh, okay, sure, no problem. And he approaches them in order to grab the camera so they could back up and take a picture of him. Because he honestly thought that that's what they were asking for. Honestly thought that. And was embarrassed when they said, no, 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 we, we want you in the picture. And said, oh, and he was just kind of, just, just turned a little red and, and acquiesced and, and they, they took the, it's just, he just doesn't think about himself. There's a freedom that comes, a freedom of ability to be able to serve, rejoicing in the goodness that's out there. Oh, here's a wonderful family want a picture. I'd love to be able to help them have that picture. So, in order just to wrap up here, as I said a little while ago, pride is easy to spot in others. Make an effort to spot it in yourself. Especially in the moment you see it in somebody else, just take that camera lens and like turn it back like this and say, okay, well, let's be fair. <laughs> let's, let's take this both ways. Also, you can ask God for the gift to see yourself the way he sees you. Ask for it. It's a gift to, to have in your heart a sense of the way he looks at you. And to understand that and see yourself. And ask for the gift to see others the way God sees them. It's like that's asking for the gift of humility. Rejoice in the good in others wherever you see it. These are actions, uh, habits that we can start to build up. And by doing that, God is able to fill our hearts with this gift, this, this grace, this blessing of humility. And it is so freeing. And it is so relaxing. And just all the errors kind of pass away and this need to defend our good name and this and, and keep up this appearances just kind of falls away. And it's just the most, it's a wonderful blessing. So I just ask you to, to, to do that. Spot it in yourself. Ask God to see the way see yourself the way he sees you and rejoice, rejoice in that gift of goodness wherever you see it.